Heavenly Father, we're grateful for all of your grace and mercy. We thank you for saving us, putting us into union with Christ, indwelling us with the Holy Spirit, giving us the word of God, and then putting us into an environment where we're challenged every single day to live the Christian life. This is a hill to climb, a mountain, Father, that we're to climb and to become like Christ. The great blessings in all this are not often obvious than the great blessing of adversity, which we've discussed before, uh, is counterintuitive. We don't think of it that way, but it is that. Help us today to understand and realize that what you're doing in our life, in the life of our nation, is grace. It's to waken us from our slumber, to make us aware uh, that, that life is brief and time is a thief when you live for your pleasures. You lose your opportunity. So make this clear to us in Christ's name, amen. I have to be careful not to pray long. I'll start preaching in the prayer. The U.S. continues to move away from the divine establishment principles on which we were founded. Now, that's pretty clear, Right? And that's going to that's going to result in increasing levels of calamity. It's just going to be calamitous. So, the idea that God would simply insulate us from all that I don't think is realistic or even preferable. He's going to allow the adversities that are coming to our nation into our very doorstep. Before long, before long you may end up with somebody camping in your yard and you're not gonna be able to do anything about it. The police won't stop it. It's what's happening all over the Southwest, the United States right now. They're just letting them loose. Now you're gonna think of that as uh, <laughs> undesirable and yet it's gonna be opportunity. It's going to be opportunity like we've not seen in America for a long time. So stop looking at all of this in a negative light. It's not that. It's not that. It's only in a negative light when your human agenda, your human dreams, I call them, are the issue for you. When you can go past your own human dreams and see what God's doing, and let this go, then you can enter into a life of meaning and purpose that lasts for eternity. That's the real goal here. As a, as a child Christian, as a young Christian, I always thought that God's plan was to fulfill my dreams. And that was the focus of my prayers, is Father, do this for me and do that for me and heal this person and heal that person and do this and open this door for my human dreams. It was mystifying to me along the way that God didn't seem to do the things I wanted him to do. The things I often ask him didn't appear to be as well for me. I came to realize at one point that the ideas that I had formed about what would be good and happy in my life we're not the same as his. One of the great blessings in life is when you can get what you want to be the same thing as what God wants. Now, how often does that, how often do those two things coincide in the same sentence? Where your desire and God's desire for you are the same. One of the ways to look at the Christian life and experiential sanctification is that we strive and, and work toward wanting what God wants and, not, and, and letting go of the things in our life that he doesn't want. See, one of the, one of the great, you know, we live, we live a phase of our Christian life wanting what we want. And then much of, often those things are disappointed or we don't, we don't receive what we want or what we get what we wanted, but it doesn't satisfy. Then we live for a time in our life trying to live with the disappointment of our life. 
because their life didn't turn out the way we thought it would, the way we wanted it to. And see, all of that has to be surrendered to the Lord because neither our initial human dreams nor the disappointment of those dreams have anything to do with living the Christian life. God has a plan for you, and the plan is his plan. It's for his purposes. So that's, that's really cheerful, right? <laughs> uh, now, you know, Ron, you were talking about hiring, you know, homosexuals in the church. They're working on legislation right now that they're likely going to pass that's going to make it where all nonprofits have to do that. You won't, you won't have an option. If you're going to keep your nonprofit status, and maybe even beyond that, you're going to have to hire people that don't align with your beliefs. I mean, they're throwing the whole thing out. It's called the Equality Act. So being equal now is not equal opportunity. It's equal outcomes. And this is the stuff that's coming to America, and it's coming fast. I mean, before you know it, these things are going to be in our lap, and we're going to have to deal with them without becoming violent, without losing our minds. But, you know, this is the challenge that God's put in front of us. Are we ready for it? Are we prepared for it? We ought to be, and we are. Listen, you are prepared for it. You are prepared for it. It's, it's interesting, it's funny that you teach a porn message to a bunch of old folks. Uh, <laughs> I thought we're, you know, I used to teach in the nursing home. And uh, anyway, that's what I felt like I was in that. But, but it's, that message was not about porn. It was about self-indulgence, living a self-indulged life. You can be self-indulged in religion, in asceticism, in exercise or sexuality, you want. So let's look at our study. Every adversity, every failure, every heartache carries with it the seed of an equal or greater benefit. Napoleon Hill, a famous writer. In the childhood phases of the Christian life, we celebrate when we fulfill our human earthly dreams. In fact, our earthly desires and goals are often I'm primarily the focus of our prayers. As we progress into spiritual adulthood and beyond into maturity, we learn that our earthly dreams often have little to do with God's dreams for us. See, his dreams for you are much, much better for you than the dreams you have for yourself. We learn to seek and focus on the things above where Christ is seated, not the things of the earth, Colossians 3, 1 and 2. We learn to celebrate our part in God's victories. See, what do we celebrate when someone is saved? What if you had to give up something that you wanted for some soul to be saved for eternity? You'd say, depends on what it was. Promise you that soul is way more valuable than whatever you're having to earthly give up. Or how about edify other believers? Defeat the forces of evil. These are God's victories. This is what God's doing. See, what God's not doing is building a prosperous kingdom for you here. If he allows prosperity in your life, it's for a reason. Not just so you can be the big guy. See, that's your dreams. This is our dreams. These are normal things that, that sinful creatures develop and and put together in our mind about what's happiness, what will make me happy? Because we're not happy. <laughs> Little babies are happy for a moment when they're fed and held and burped and they poop. Then they're happy for just a little while. I'm pretty much the same way, you know. Uh, <laughs> just ask Rhonda. She burps me and then I'll leave her alone for a little while. All right. So we learn to celebrate our adversities. Why? Because of what they produce. 
what they do for us. Knowing that God is using them to transform us from temporal concerns to eternal results. Now, the whole thing was excel. The message was excel. Don't stroll, don't meander. This is not, listen, most people will try to get through this. They're living with the disappointment and sadness and depression and discouragement of not getting their dreams. They may not even have real distinct dreams, but they know that what they're living is not what they wanted and not what they wanted it to be. And so they live in this low-grade depression and discouragement, trying to get through this thing with some kind of honor and dignity. I think that's most people. And I, I'm telling you, that's not, and, and you can do that, and God will let you do that. It's not what he wants for you. No more than that would be what you want for your own children. He wants us to have a greater life, but we have to turn and embrace this. We have to embrace this. We've got to quit, quit. See, as long as your life is, is hurt and pain and sorrow over what happened or didn't happen, you can't embrace and understand what you're really in. See, we're in a, we're in a race and we get distracted by all the things on the sidelines. When you finally can get back up on the path and see the, the racetrack, you go, okay, let's run. Let's get there. So Romans 5, Paul's just now into the solution phase. First three chapters, he deals with the problem, ending up in Romans 3 that there's no one matches the glory of God. No, not one. No one lives up to the glory of God. There's none of us that are righteous. Then he goes into solution phase. He talks about how God is determined to be righteous and to make sinners righteous. That's, of course, the cross, the resurrection. He gets into chapter 5, and he's going to get into some Five, six, seven, and eight are real solution oriented for the Christian life. So in five, verse two verses, therefore having been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, whom we also have been given access by faith into this grace, into this grace in which we stand. And we, we, and we rejoice in the hope of the future glory of God. In other words, the confident expectation that we're going to be part of that. He's going to tell you in chapter 6 that your position in Christ, that you're united in, with his death, burial, and resurrection, which has opened up this newness of life, he calls it, this possibility to walk this new life based on your position and to, and to overcome to tear down the old man beliefs and ideas that hold you over here in the flesh. But in five, he's just starting to develop it. So he says, rejoice, rejoice. Now that's that word, boast, exult. Um, yeah, my New American Standard calls it exult. It's the Greek word kalkomai, and it means to boast, to brag, to celebrate, or rejoice. It's to rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. The word hope means confident expectation. What's the glory of God? This is, has to do with the revealing of Christ in his return in the millennium, in the future, and all the way to the new heaven and earth. Look, we're part of that. We're, you know, where he is, we're going to be what? With him. In him, part of him, going through all that. See, he says, as I look ahead to my future in Christ, I'm just overwhelmed with great with gratitude, and I rejoice. And everybody goes, we got you, brother. We know what you're talking about. In Ephesians 1.18, he says, I want you to use your visual capacities, the eyes of your heart, to visualize the hope of his calling. Same idea here. What is the confidence that we have because of who we are in Christ? Basically the same idea. So he says, rejoice as we envision being there with Jesus, 
When he comes back to earth, the drama of the great white throne, the new heaven and new earth forever with him in eternity, rejoice in that. And listen, whether you do it openly, I know that you do. Are you not glad you're saved? Holy smokes. I mean, that's the biggest thing in my life is that I'm safe. I'm safe. People who don't understand that think they can lose their salvation, I'm not sure how they live. They live in a state of denial, of, of conflicted, inner, inner mechanism type denial. They can't put that all together in their mind because they don't live up to the very behavior they require of others. Or if they do, then they're the big man and anyway, it's a mess. It's a mess. But, so we rejoice. He says, rejoice. He says, you've been justified. I mean, made righteous. You have peace with God. Access to the king. That, that word access means to, you have an, you've been given an audience with the king. You're given an audience with the king. Standing in grace. And he says, celebrate your union with Christ. Then, and he says, not only do we rejoice in the confidence that we have, and this is kind of an expanded translation here that I have. Not only do we re rejoice in the confidence that we will share in the Lord's glory, but we also exalt or boast or rejoice in our adversities. Why? Because we know that adversity develops endurance. Endurance allows us to experience proof and witnessing the proof of the power of God's promises produces confidence. Confidence in God never disappoints like confidence in self or confidence in others or confidence in the world or confidence in your earthly dreams. None of that, all that disappoints because the love of God has been fully, totally poured out within our hearts through the Holy Spirit who he has given us. So we rejoice in the future participation in Christ and now, in, see, that's positional sanctification, what we talked about last week. This week, we're talking experiential or practical sanctification. And now, so he's gone from positional sanctification. Now he's into practical, experiential sanctification. How does this work? How does it work? Why do we have adversity? If God loves us and we're his children, how does he, why does he allow this? Why does he let things go sour? Why does he let things go wrong? The question is, does he let things go wrong? The real question is, what's wrong? What is wrong? Jackie's about to help lead a conference of people that have gone through trauma. We call it trauma. And that rightly so. I've learned, I've just learned in the last year, I'm doing it starting Sunday night tonight. I'm starting a thing on depression. After that, I'll do some things on anxiety. But it's interesting what the brain does with trauma. The brain takes trauma like PTSD. The brain takes trauma and those neurons that hold those memories, it splits them off from the rest of the neural system and isolates them. That's, what's called, that's called denial. You experience that as denial, suppression. You suppress the feelings related to it. This is just an automatic defense system that God created, put into the soul, or sin did. I don't know which one, but Christ never used it. He took it all head on. But it's like a, it's like a, a blowing a fuse, and it sets that stuff over there where, you, where it's not overwhelming you at every moment so you can go and live your life. Ultimately, that has to be reintegrated into the rest of the whole memory system to be able to get to, to resolve the issue. When you know, you know that you have fully resolved it as a Christian, not when you're just comfortable with it, but when you can be grateful to God for allowing it, for allowing you the opportunity to face that and overcome it with his grace. Now that's the ultimate. And that may be way beyond what you can imagine, but that's, that's, that's the super grace believer 
who's able to look at what God allows and realize that all of this is part of the angelic conflict for a reason. He doesn't allow that carelessly in your life. He didn't allow you to be hurt like that carelessly, oblivious to you. That's ridiculous. It's, it's for a reason. It's for a purpose that he allowed it. And you go, well, that's really, really hard. That, that God who supposedly loves me allowed me to be hurt like that. Yes, it is really hard. Well, how else do you explain it? I mean, there I, I, I've been reading about human trafficking lately. I've, somehow I've got into that. I don't know how, but it's horrible. It's, it's more horrible than you can imagine. Nobody's told you how horrible it is, and I'm not going to. It's more horrible than you can imagine how bad that stuff is. And yet, God allows that. He allows evil to flourish and thrive. And then he uses it for his own purposes. And he gives everybody who lives a chance to know his son and to use the grace of God to overcome all the things that happen in their life. That's the, that's the path. That's the Christian path. This life is not nirvana. This is not heaven. This is not going to be heaven. The whole American dream of making enough money and saving enough money and getting to be some old person and travel and do whatever you want to do. Okay. That's what blows your dress up. Hope you have enough health to do that. But look, if you want to torture me, then put me in a Winnebago and drive me across the country. I'd rather be doing this. I'd rather be serving the Lord. I'd rather be accomplishing his purpose. I'd rather be going through adversity and overcoming it with grace, trusting him for it, watching him deliver me or watching him not deliver me so that his grace and his mercy and his love can be exhibited. That's who, the, that's who we want to be, the God that, that celebrates that. Now, am I right? Yes? No? No, you know, I know I always want God to give me some ice cream. I just want some ice cream. Well, look, so do I, as you can see. All right, rejoice in tribulations, he says, thlipsis. This means trouble, difficulty, adversity, persecution. It covers a lot of troubles. It's a word in John 16, 33, when the, he said, the, Jesus said, in the world, you will have trouble. Be encouraged, I have overcome the world. James says the same word in different, calls it different kinds. Of, James uses a different word, different kinds of temptations. Pyrosmos means testings, temptations to sin. See, adversity in your life is a temptation to sin because it, it violates and hinders your human goals and agenda. The things that you've, invent, you've attached your heart to these things in, the, in your earthly realm to be your happiness. And look, they're legitimate, rightly so things. Your wife, your kids, your family, your health, you know, golf. Oh, how can you, anyway. So, but look, none of those things, all of those things are very nice that God allows us to have, but there comes a point when he may allow you to lose some of those things. I remember being a little kid. Oh, you know, I don't, maybe every little kid goes through this, but there was a time in my, that it, just in my little head that my family was very happy. Everybody seemed happy. Saturday mornings, you know, it was just smiles and I remember that. But you know, and, and look, you get that image in your head, you want to hang on to that. You want that to be your life. You want your life to be that. Those things are long gone in my life. Mother, father, brother, sister, all these things are gone. Now, is that wrong? Should I, should I still hang on to that and be disappointed that God did not? No. It's all passing. 
We have to adjust. We have to change the way we think about these things to understand what God's doing. Okay. Now, he says, because adversity develops, it produces. Kater Godzama uh, comes from two Greek words. Kata means downward pressure. Ergodzo comes from ergon. It means energy. It's, in, it's to use energy to develop or produce something using great pressure. Pressure, like a blacksmith. To hammer out with heat. Manufacture a product by pressure and struggle. And what does it manufacture? What is adversity? What's God's purpose for in our life? To hammer out endurance. This is the first thing that God does in your Christian life is he hammers out endurance. Now, what is endurance? Hupa mone means to remain under the weight. It means to be steadfast under pressure, patient under adverse circumstances, to remain under the pressure of waiting on the Lord to fulfill his promises producing confidence that he will see every time that God honors his word in your life. You have an issue, you put the word of God on it, and you wait on God to fulfill it. See the faith cycle, right? We're waiting over here in this last phase for God to come through, to God to honor his word. And when he does, wow, you go, hello, hello. Then he, then he does it again in your life. Here's the next problem. Honors his word. All the while, see, before we get to this honor of his word part, we're over here flailing around and reacting and being worried and fearful and angry and blah, 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 until we finally come, okay, we wait on God. Boom, he does it again. Boom, he does it again. You know what that builds? Confidence. Confidence to stand still under pressure waiting on God to do what he's going to do. That's endurance. Endurance is confidence. It's developed confidence that God has given his word and that he will move heaven and earth if necessary to honor it. So we stand firm, waiting on him to do what he's going to do. We stand firm. You don't run. You don't react. You wait. Waiting on the Lord, very strong Faith. All right. So the next one, endurance leads us to proof. Now, some call this character, and I understand that. It means it's something, it's a, it's a product. I think the idea here is not proving the believer. I don't see the believer being proven. I see God's word being proven. The one thing that's at question here is not me. I'm, I'm a mess, or even my faith. I mean, I, one day I've got faith, the next day I don't. What's in question here and what's at the focus of all this is what God has said. So I see this word called, I call it proof. So he says, endurance or perseverance brings about, and, and the New American Standards call it proven character, I say proof. The prosdokimazo, uh, this is dokime, is the process of purifying ore out of the ground by superheating it. Gold is heavier than all the other metals and they boil to the top. They're scooped off by the goldsmith. As he continues to purify the gold, he knows it's pure when he can see his face, face reflected in the gold with no blemishes. So you superheat it. The gold goes to the bottom, the slag goes to the top, it's scooped off, and it's pure. When you know when you can look in the, in the crucible and just see your face with no blemishes, you've got pure gold. That's how they did it in the ancient world. Dokimazo was that process. So proven proof here is pure gold. All right. As we endure, waiting on the Lord to honor his word, we discover that he always does, and we become, become totally persuaded that he is faithful. Proof. He proves himself. Adversity is a challenge for the believer's faith, but what it is actually put to the test is God's word, where he is able to prove to us over and over under pressure that he is faithful to honor his promises. That's what's happened in my life. He's proven to me over and over and over again that he's 
he's there, he loves me, he's got me, he's, I'm safe, he's, under, he's got it under control. So, thirdly, he produces hope. See, he, he builds endurance in you so that you can wait it out and he can show you again and again and again he's going to honor his word. So ultimately, your faith and your trust and your confidence is locked on to God's word. Nothing else. Nothing else. And this produces hope. And hope really is the word elpis is confidence. It's persuaded confidence in God's proven faithfulness. You follow? See, this is a progression. It's a progression in your life. As God shows himself and his and honors his word over and over again, it persuades us to be confident that he will continue to do so no matter what. And listen, when your confidence is in him and his word, you'll, it'll never, you'll never be disgraced or disappointed. My dreams disappoint. My promises disappoint. Ask those in my life that love me that I love, that I've wanted to do better for, that I've tried to do better for, and yet have not. Is that not the same in your life? Don't you come up short? But listen, if, you, if, that's, what you're, if that's what you're hanging on to, don't hang on to me. Hang on to God. Hang on to what he's promised because that is, you know, the world burns up, but the word of God stands forever. So, that's real confidence, and that confidence doesn't disappoint. This word disgrace is kataiskuno. It means to be dishonored, disgraced, put to shame, or disappointed. When our confidence is in God, we will never fail or dishonor him or self. And finally, he talks about the love of God, the agape, the committed love, poured out into our hearts. The word poured out is ekkeo, perfect passive indicative means completely poured out. There's none left to pour out. You already got all of God's love. It's salvation in union with the beloved son. We become the, the object of all of his divine love. And then there's James who's got James 1, 2 through 4, consider it pure joy, fellow believer, when you encounter various kinds of trials, knowing that the testing or proving of your faith or or, yeah, your faith produces endurance and let endurance have its perfect result that you may be perfect, complete, lacking nothing. Let me just give you a few ideas right quick. Living under the effects of Adam's sin in the devil's world guarantees that the lives of believers and unbelievers will be filled with difficulties and challenges of all kinds. There's no getting away from challenges. That's, that's childish thinking. That's what Paul calls thinking like a child. There's no getting away from the difficulties. There's no getting away from getting old, maybe getting sick. There's no getting away from those things. You're not going to escape. God delivers us through these things. Adversity describes outer circumstances. These are my terms, okay? Adversity describes the outer circumstance and events that run contrary to, the human, to our human agenda. Suffering, on the other hand, and sometimes people call what I'm discussing suffering, suffering is the inner experience when we interpret difficult circumstances in a negative light. When we see, see, when you're hooked to your human agenda, that's still what you're leaning on and attached to to be the, the deal in your life. When that, and, and, and God allows circumstances that shatters that, squashes that, then your heart is broke, all right? Your heart is broke, absolutely. But when you're able to let go of that and reattach yourself to what God's doing in your life, and that becomes your heart, you're never disappointed. You're always challenged, you're always right in there. It's good. I played baseball, and I know I've said this before. I played baseball, played football, and but I loved baseball, and I played shortstop. And my father, who loved me and was and loved baseball, would take we'd go out to the field, and he would hit me grounder after grounder after grounder, <clears throat> all different kinds. 
most people thought of that as, oh boy, that's, that's tough, adversity. You know, I loved it. I thrived on it, okay? That's what adversity is in your life. It's practice. It's a chance to feel all different kinds of things with the word of God and the grace of God, trusting in him. I had to trust my glove. And boy, I got popped in the face a number of times. But you learn to trust your glove. You learn to trust God, to feel all these things. It's just practice, folks. You're safe. <laughs> nothing, nothing can get to you. Nothing that counts. You're not going to lose anything that really counts. And I'm not saying you not don't have loss. But it's not what we think it is. The tragedy. There's no such thing as tragedy for the Christian. Secondly, God uses the normal adversities of life under the sin nature and the devil's world to perform a manufacturing work on the soul of the believer. Ephesians 2.10 calls us his production. He exposes our wrong beliefs, habituated thinking patterns, and any behaviors we practice that are not aligned with his will for our particular life so that we might see them to remove them. Arthur Golden said, adversity is like a strong wind. It tears, away from, it tears away from us all but the things that cannot be torn so that we ourselves are, so that we see ourselves as we truly are. And boy, adversity reveals who you really are. Because when the pressure comes, you go to whatever your default is. It's just instinct. So Deuteronomy 8 talks about how God led them into the desert to reveal what was in their heart. He said, I humbled you and let you be hungry so that I could feed you with manna. You know why he wanted to feed them? You know why he did that? He let them get hungry so he could feed them with manna so that you could know that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word of the mouth of God. In other words, they're in the desert. There's no food. There's no water. That's what you call adversity. And God let them into that situation just like he does you so that he could feed you from heaven and water you from heaven so that you can understand that the issue here is not the food or the water. It's the promise. It's the word of God. That's what you count on. When you, when you get that, then you begin to realize that the adversities that he's allowing is so that you can see those things. Imagine being in that spot, in the desert, no food, no water, not knowing how you're going to get, and, and complaining and whining and moaning, and God sends food. Elijah, bird comes in with ribeye. So finally, he uses the, the normal adversities we all face as challenges to, to, so that we can use them. See, there's two sides to this. One is the purification side. Adversity reveals what's wrong with us. And there's plenty wrong with all of us. And then the other side of it is, is as we deal with that part, other side is the armor of God and the new man's skills. It gives you practice to use these skills to become this new man. These are both sides of it, the take off and put on. God uses the normal adversities in the angelic conflict as his opportunity to demonstrate his righteous character, and it gives believers opportunity to reveal blessings of trusting and obeying God that fallen angels rejected and we could go on but we're at the end here one way to imagine the goal of the christian life is when you have moved from your earthly human agenda to be able to rejoice when you face challenges because of spiritual growth and we experience the impact for god as he demonstrates his love grace and wisdom to the creation are you willing to be used for God to do that. Or look, are you still at a place in your Christian life where you just want God to do something for you? You still, look, and I understand that. You still are needy because you haven't understood yet that God has already given you all you need. You've not reached that place. And so you need to keep striving to be filled by God. 
Be filled by God. Let God meet your needs. Let, your, let yourself realize that God loves you and has kept you safe and is going to provide for you and give you everything he wants you to have. That's a fact. It's only then that you can find some kind of contentment with him and understand that you're at peace with him. That's when ministry really begins out of your soul because what he gives you, you can give away. When you know that you have enough money for yourself, you're not worried. Why, are you, why do you have enough money for yourself? Because you got enough saved? Is that why? No, because he promised. It's not, you don't live by that savings account alone. You live by the promise of God. Then you can give money away. You can give money to what, where money needs to go. All right. Father, we're grateful. I pray these things are helpful. I pray that you give me the grace and capacity to say these things in a way that, are, that they can be received and understood. Make it simple for us that we can relate to it and grab hold of it and make application in our life. I thank you for the first hour, for the passion that was shown, uh, for the message, for the desire to see these this Bible church, Father, to grow and to begin to flourish and to mature and to, and to live out this Christian life in a way that we sacrifice ourselves, give ourselves over to your use, be that adversity or pleasure or whatever, so that you can reveal yourself through us to the world. We love you. We praise you in Christ's name. Amen.